This sermon series called Portraits of Jesus in the Old Testament, we're wrapping up tonight, has looked at how the covenants and prophecies of the Old Testament were fulfilled in Jesus. The covenant with Abraham, that all the world would be blessed through his descendants, was fulfilled in Christ. The stairway from heaven that Jacob saw opened with angels and ascending and descending to heaven was Jesus, the only way to the Father. The fourth man in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was the same God in Christ who went through the penalty of death on the cross to save us. God goes into the fire for us. And last time I pointed out that in John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus said, You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, and yet you refuse to come to me to have life. And we must remember, when Jesus says the scriptures testify about me, that he's talking about what we call the Old Testament. The New Testament didn't exist yet. He's saying that these things that you're reading about, Abraham's covenant, Jacob's stairway, even the deliverance of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace, this is all about me. In the last message, we're going to look at the prophecy of Isaiah, which we saw in our our, uh, Call to worship found in chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. And we're going to see how Jesus that we celebrate at Christmas, the same Jesus, fulfilled this prophecy too. Here's what Isaiah 9, 1 to 7 says. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For to us is born a child, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on, and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This passage is very familiar to us. For many of us, Handel's Messiah, sung oftentimes at Christmas, has imprinted the words on our mind, and so when we read them, we can almost hear them. someone in a choir singing, For unto us a child is born. But we seldom consider the context in which these words appeared in Isaiah's prophecy. And so we might miss the main message of how they connect to us believers in the 21st century. And when we look at that context, we find a reality that we probably often miss or, or maybe even deny. The chapter before this passage talks about how the people had fallen into all kinds of idolatry. And the result was that the land was in a time of darkness and gloom. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 19 says, When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness." Well, we know that the people of Israel had fallen into idolatry, and as a result of that, Isaiah's warning came true, and they were hauled off into captivity in a foreign land. His prophecy came to a people living in darkness, and that darkness of idolatry is something that there's a good chance they didn't know how dark it was at the time until the light dawned on them. And it's the same for us today. Many of us live in darkness. And I I mean us, not those people out there somewhere. Many of us in the church don't even know that something is not right. It hasn't dawned on upon us yet that we're in a mess and that we have idols too. And we think that this is one thing we can surely say that we don't have a problem with. And maybe not in the sense of little golden statues. But as Pastor Steve King, who inspired this message, I said at the beginning of the series, says, he says, idolatry is the default setting of every human heart. You probably don't think that that's a problem for you. You think idolatry involves those little statues or Ouija boards or something weird like that. But the fact is, idolatry is anything other than God 
that you build your identity around, anything that acts as a God substitute for you, good things can become idols. For this, us in the ministry, a church service or a Christian ministry can even become an idol to us. And when you substitute something else in your life for the place that is rightfully God's, then there are consequences. You become unstable. Say, for example, you put your confidence or your identity in your looks. Well, you know, just take a look at the past yearbooks of the church and you can see those don't, those don't last, do they? And some of us are, are a lot balder and a lot fatter and a lot other things that we just, it doesn't last. It's an unstable waste, way to base your, your uh, identity. If you put it in your health, well, that's going to go to you. Your career, that can change really quick overnight. Put it even in your family that we celebrate so much here at Christmas time. And you'll, if that's where you find your identity, you'll, know, you'll find that that's not a safe place to find your identity. It's a very precarious situation because when you lose someone or have to give up someone, uh, everything changes. You can also find that if you have a God substitute, you're a slave to the thing which you replace God with. It might be your drive to be successful, for example. And soon, you, nothing else will matter but to accomplish that goal. And, and even if that means compromising your beliefs or cutting corners or using unethical tactics or a little bit of dishonesty, and pretty soon you're a different person than you started out. But most of all, anything that you allow to act as a God substitute ultimately will not satisfy you. And it will leave you empty. It will leave you in darkness, in distress, in gloom, in the words of Isaiah. So we must face this darkness in our own, of our own idolatry before we can experience the light of Christ. We have to recognize that we need a Savior. If we don't feel like we need a Savior, then the words, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, is like, oh, that's sweet. And we're thinking of you know, little babies. It's, those are nice. We smile. Just like those little kitten videos on, on Facebook. How cute. But that's all it will mean to you unless you recognize that those words, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, are not just nice sentimental words, but they're life-changing words. Sweet words, maybe to some, but not words of hope. It's not until you recognize that you need something else, that your greatest problem is you and your temptation to put something else in God's place. It's not until then that the light dawns on you and you recognize, I need a Savior. And the good news of Christmas is, for those of us who have had that light dawn on us, who have recognized something's not right in Whoville or wherever else we are, we, we need him, we need a Savior. And the good news of Christmas is that in Christmas, God sent us that Savior in the person of Jesus Christ. The same region where Isaiah was describing the land of darkness is the same region where Jesus would later live and, and teach his, preach his message. Zebulun and Naphtali are on the northern coast of the Sea of Galilee. That's where Capernaum is. And in Matthew chapter 4, we find that that's where Jesus went and lived. Matthew says it was to fulfill, fulfill this prophecy that a light will shine in this place. They will be the first ones to have a dawn come to them. And Jesus began to preach there, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And for those who were looking for the kingdom of heaven, that was really good news. For those who weren't looking, it was like, oh, that's nice. Same way with the message of Christmas. For those who are looking for the Savior, it's such good news. But for those who aren't, it's just another day. The light that Isaiah said was shining on those who lived in this land of shadow of death was in the person in Jesus Christ. And he said, I have come to seek and save those who are lost. But those who are not lost or who don't know they're lost will never ask for direction. And they won't know that they need saving. Many years ago, uh, I, I first started telling this story of, and I don't know where I first heard it, but it was on my Christmas Eve. And it was a snowy kind of a Christmas Eve, and a man's family was getting ready to go to a service like this one. And he just basically said, I see no point. I don't understand this whole point of why Jesus would have to come as a baby or whatever. So it's just ridiculous to me, and I'm not going to go. 
So his family went without him, he stayed home. But he was a compassionate and kind man. It was a very cold, uh, wintry night. And there were some birds that he saw freezing in the cold, coming up toward the house. And he decided, you know, they're, they're not going to make it tonight out in this cold. And so he went out to the barn and opened the barn doors and, and turned on the light and tried to entice them in, tried to shoo them in, tried to put out breadcrumbs and tried to do everything he can to get these birds in. And he said, don't you know I'm trying to save you? If, if only I could become a bird so I could tell you what, it, what I'm doing here is trying to help you, then maybe you'd let me save you. And then it suddenly dawned on him that that's what God did on Christmas. He became one of us so that he could communicate in a way that we could understand and save us. But it's not until that light dawns on us that we get it. And when it does dawn on us, then it changes how we live. Our lives become centered on God instead of God's substitutes. The, the Bible says, Isaiah says, the government will be upon his shoulders. He will be the, the authority that our life is centered around. Our lives will be governed by his will and by pleasing him. God became a man so that he could live the life that we couldn't live, to die the death that we should have died, to come back from the grave in order to change us on the inside so that when we see what God is like, then we will want to be different. When we see that he loves us that much, that he would go to that far, then we want to center our life around him. Well, surely maybe you know, he would come to this earth if he, could, if he was born in a palace or if he was born in some of the you know, you know, really nice ritzy places, but to come in a, a dung-filled stable, the lowest of low among shepherds who wouldn't even be trusted to testify in court, and, and a poor little couple, he went that far because he wants us to know that no matter how low we feel or how low we are, he came for us too. This Christmas, let's embrace the message of Isaiah that the problem is us and our tendency to go after good things and try to make them the thing and make something else in charge of us other than God. And we can't change our hearts. That's the problem we have. We can't do it. And if we're left to our own, we're going to probably fill our lives with some substitute that's going to plunge us into darkness. But thanks to God, in our darkest time, he sent us a light to us. Looking back on that first Christmas, John said it this way, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And he went on to say, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son of God who came from the father full of grace and truth. Hundreds and hundreds of years earlier, Isaiah had proclaimed that the light of God was coming in the words unto us. A child is born. Unto us a son is given. It's about Jesus. It's about us recognizing that we need him. When we come to this table in just a few moments, anyone who has recognized that they have needed him, that they need what only he can do for us, Anyone who's called upon him and asked him to be their Lord is welcome to come to this table. Before we have communion, we're going to sing a song. But let's pray. Lord, as we come to your table, as we sing in preparation, uh, we pray that you will speak to our hearts and that we'll recognize that sometimes we put things in, in your place in our life. And it might be family, which is a good thing. And it might be our health or, or healthiness or being fit or whatever else might uh, be the thing that's in our uh, life that seems important. And it might be having stuff and it might be accumulating wealth and all kinds of things that we think we can find our satisfaction in. Help us, Lord, to find our identity in you. That's the one thing that can't be taken away from us. We need you, Lord. And as we come to your table, may we be aware both of our need and of your great provision in your son, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.